Well, welcome to uh, part two of our hydronic balance update and review. We've been pushing with you that the ASHRAE method is proportioning balance. So what we're going to do now is we're going to work our way through what is proportioning balance, what are some methods of balancing a simple system so you understand the theory, so you understand the principles involved in balance. Let's just jump right into it. First question would be why would we balance a system to begin with? I hope the impeller trim example gave you a pretty good reason for that, saving a lot of money. But there's a lot of discussion about balance as always. It's an old topic. And if you go back to some older 35, 40 year ago presentations from ASHRAE, from the TC committees on balance, you know, ASHRAE's always kind of have a mixed bag on this. One was, uh, we never balance ours. We don't need to. Camp two was kind of balance. Uh, yeah, we've been balancing all of our lives. And then number three camp is, what are you guys arguing about? The bottom line is you got to balance. And then and whatever you've heard or talked about, I think you need to understand balancing is the key. Proper balance is the key to energy savings. And the best way to prove that to you is to take an actual example and let's balance it. This is going to be a real simple example here in front of you. And I only got three zones. Each zone is 500 GPM each. So each zone, and I want you to start thinking this way, the percent of total flow to each zone is 33%. Now, I know this is not a real job that you'd have equal 5 out of GPM zones, but I'm trying to get the message across to you and teach you the principle of proportioning balance. I want you to understand what that means. And the first step is kind of begin to understand what percentage is zone 1 of the total flow. You're doing proportioning balance, you've got to begin to think that way a little bit. So let's walk through this and see what we've got. We got a situation here where we got a pump that's been designed and specified for 1500 GPM at 70 feet ahead. Now, have a little fun in your mind, right quick. What is the actual head required for the critical circuit in this particular example? And if you look at it real closely, the critical circuit is zone three. So let's just add them up, starting off at the discharge of the pump. You see a throttling valve on the discharge of the pump, but that's wide open right now. We're not going to worry about it too much. Let's just kind of count the numbers. So I got 4, 8, 12, last circuit, 22, 32, 36, 30, 40, I got 54 feet. Hope everybody sees that if I count the head through that critical circuit, I come up with actually needing 1500 GPM at 54 feet. Now we got a pump with 70 feet. So the pump is overheaded, which is very typical. That's why we went through the impeller trim example just before. This is a typical example. We need to proportionally balance this to meet ASHRAE code, but we also have a pump that's overheaded. So what do we need to do to make this system balanced? Let's just take a simple approach to this. So you understand we only need 54 feet, you got 70 feet, you got a pump at 1500. What's going to happen when I turn the 1500 GPM pump on? Let's turn it on. Okay, we turn it on and it flies out to 1800 GPM at 64 feet. Now, before we showed you we had a design of 1500 at 70, we just turned the pump on. We didn't balance anything. We just turned the pump on. Typical way things get done at startup. You know, why not turn things on? Let's see what we got. Now, the green star is where we designed it to. The green star, the impeller example here is a green impeller line. The green is where we put on our plans that we wanted the pump to run. 1500 GPM, 70 feet ahead. But the pumps are stupid. They don't know any different. And the pump's been overheaded. So the pump's going to slide down that impeller curve to the blue star. And it's going to run there until we balance it. So reality, the real system curve is the red system curve. That's the real reaction we're getting of 1,800 GPM at 64 feet ahead. So that's where we really are when we turn the pump on. Let's just kind of go back real quick to our example. What flows did we get to zone 1, zone 2, and zone 3 when we turned the pump on? No circuit setters, no balancing valves, everything just wide open. Total flow, 1,800 to 64. Remember, each zone was to be 500 each. Zone 1 is overflowing at 670, might even be noisy. Zone 2 is overflowing at 652. 
Zone 3 is at 478, design is 500. We're underflowing, but you'd probably get away with it. I dare say no one cooling-wise would ever know the difference between 478 and 500. But it's not proportioning balance. It's just running wild. But you could possibly walk off this job and it would work. It will not meet energy code. You're wasting a lot of energy and you're not doing the right thing. But it might work okay. Let's keep going with this concept. Why are we worried about it? It's brake horsepower. It's KW. It's the operating cost. See, our GPM goes time the feet ahead. Of course, you got the pump efficiency in there. But we're running at 1,864. You plug those numbers in that formula, you're going to get a higher brake horsepower than if you were to run at some lower flow rate and lower head. In other words, not being balanced is costing you a whole bag of money. So let's go back to our example. We're 1,864 feet. We're pulling 36 brake horsepower. That's where we are when we just turn it on not balanced. Hang on to that 36 brake horsepower. Let's see where we're going to go with it. What's going to happen? What can we do to reduce the 36 brake horsepower? Okay, we will see that after balance and after impeller trim or verbal speed drive slow it down, we can cut the 36 to 25. That's 11 brake horsepower savings, which is a lot of cash if you can do that. In this case, it's very easily done. Let's see what we might do next to balance. What would be the thing we could do? Well, we could go and say, okay, why don't we just throttle back at the discharge of the pump? We don't have any circuit setters, any flow limiters, no balancing devices available now. The little blue items are just two-way valves. So if we just throttled at the pump, we could take it back down to 1,500 GPM at 70 feet ahead at the pump, and that's what was on the plans and specs. But what happens to the flow in each zone as we did that? Now remember, we wanted one-third, one-third, one-third. What happened? Zone 1 is still at 558. It's okay. Zone 2 is at 543. But look at zone 3 now. Zone 3 is down to 400 or less GPM, and we're going to start getting in trouble as far as making the system work properly. And obviously, it's not proportioning balance because we don't have equal percentage flows in each one of these things. We don't have one-third, one-third, one-third. So that would work, maybe, except Zone 3 is going to be trouble. And I have not balanced it. There's a lot better job we can do. What else could we do here? Well, why balance? Let's go to Ashrick. Here's an old ASHRAE statement, but basically it's pretty simple. Balancing properly will help you cut the pumping costs. It'll make your systems work better. It's just no way around it. We need to balance every zone to make sure it's at the required flow at the minimum head needed from the pump. Do we need balancing valves? Yeah, that's always a question kind of gets answered, and the answer is obviously yes. So without me going too far, system warm-up and cool-down, a direct return system. If you don't have balancing valves on the zones in close to the pump, at warm-up, those zones are going to overflow, and the guys way out at the end are not going to get anything. So I think everybody understands night setbacks and things like that. If you don't balance and you've got two-way valves, and you start off to trying to get a recover a system that's direct return without balancing valves, you're going to have issues. Undersized coils. If you don't have enough flow, your coils will be undersized. Thermostats set beyond design points. I'll give you an example in a few minutes. You know, if you're counting on the two-way valve to balance your system, which is one theory, then in order for a two-way valve to do your balance, a two-way valve's got to be what? Throttled. If a two-way valve's wide open, it's not balancing anything. Two-way valve modulating and slightly up close, in theory, you could say you're balancing. But what happens if somebody comes along and takes a 72-degree design for your whole building and sets it to 65 degrees on a T-stat in the room? Now, every two-way valve that you set down to 65 is now wide open. And there's no way to limit its flow, and it's going to be an energy hog and take all the flow, and the guys on further down won't get anything. That becomes critical. Without balancing valves, control valves will partially close at design flow. In other words, if, if you don't have a balancing valve, everything's picked right, it should be partially closed at design flow. If you have a balancing valve, you can give it more stroke, more authority. We can get it a little bit later. But balancing valves are critical.
connecting your two-way valves work properly. That's the message. What does ASHRAE say? This is an old ASHRAE energy code to show you how far back this goes. 90.1-2010, 90.1-2013 says what? Same thing. But it started back in 2001. That's how long this energy codes thing's been out. So every state's there. Everybody has this in the codes already. So it's not a 2010 thing. It's my whole point. It goes way back. All hydronic systems shall be proportioning balanced. Proportioning balanced. Hang on to that. In a matter to minimize the throttle losses. In other words, they want the triple duty valve or the throttle device when you get through to be left in an open position. You don't want to ride down the road with one foot and one foot on the accelerator. You want to have that pump pumping the most efficient point you can get. Why would you have the throttle valve throttle if you've got it properly balanced? So you want, either you're going to trim that pump impeller or you're going to variable, vary the speed. Either one of those is acceptable. Message is, Asher's been preaching for years and years and years. Proportioning balance, wind up where your discharge valve is wide open. So here we go. Why would I bring up uh, this night setback thing? Here's a situation at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Very simple. This was just a letter that everybody who's employed there got. I want you to kind of get this in your head because this is going on not just at University of North Carolina, but everywhere. Everywhere you go, schools, hospitals, everybody's doing this kind of thing. As a part of the university's implementation of a campus-wise energy conservation method, they're going to have setback. So after hours, they're going to take the thermostats and they're going to let the systems drift. So the word blue word drift after 8 p.m., reduced airflow and temperatures allow the system to drift. Now what does this mean? That means they're going to lose control of the space, whether it's heating and or cooling, it's not going to be to the set point. So when you come back to work and you go fully operational, what are all the two-way valves going to do that they're out of control? They're going to go what? Wide open. And when the two valves go wide open, two-way valves go wide to recover the cooling or the heating load, what happens? You're going to overflow those two-way valves unless they are balanced. If they're not balanced, they're going to overflow, take every GPM they can get. So if you don't do it that way, you're going to have huge issues on the direct return system out of the end of the line. So the message is night setback is fine. But if you don't balance, you're going to have trouble when you try to recover because those buildings closest to the chiller plant or closest to the boiler are going to get all the energy they want first, and the guys way out at the end are going to suffer. Now, let's look at a typical cooling coil. I think it's important to ask you the question, how accurate do you need to balance? Here's a typical cooling coil per ash ray, and a cooling coil is going to have latent and sensible pieces to it. The sensible pieces that teach that on the wall, the latent pieces, that moisture content that we're taking out of the air. So let's just look at the situation. If we had 90% flow, 90% flow in that little red line, percent flow across the bottom, where would we be? At 90% flow, I think latent wise is about 80% of the latent, and we get about 95% of the total, and we got near about 100% of the sensible. In other words, if we had a design flow plus or minus 10%, we'd probably take care of most cooling loads. I think most people try to go for plus or minus 5% when they balance, but as you see here, plus or minus 10 wouldn't be too bad. So the message again is very simple. Uh, five, plus or minus 5 is a good design, plus or minus 10 you may never know in balance, and so that gives you some guidelines. Looking at heating, if I'm at 90% flow on heating, I'm at what, 90, and heating remember it's just sensible BTUs, I'm at 90, what, 95%, 97%, and again, can you calculate your heating loads that accurate? I doubt it, so I'm making the argument that plus or minus 5% works fine, plus or minus 10%, you may never know if you balance that. So balancing needs to be done, but you do have some error here that you can absorb into your system and it will still work fine. Let's go back to our 1500 GPM salmon foot ahead situation. Why don't we just go in and read and set and balance? Let's say we add circuit setters. So we've added the green circuit setters at, the, at, the, at zone one, zone two, and zone three. We've added circuit setters. We know we got a pump that does 1,500 GPM at 70 feet ahead, and we're going to read and set and balance. What does that mean? We're just going to add a circuit setter to each zone. We're going to go into that circuit setter at zone three, zone two, and zone one. We're going to set it for 500 GPM. 
we work our way and we set them off a 500 GPM, and then zone uh, one's got 32 feet of drop, zone uh, through the circuit, circuit center at 500 GPM, zone two has 19 feet of drop at 500 GPM, and zone three has what, uh, 500 GPM and 16 feet of drop. So that's what we've done to take care of the pump at 1500 GPM, 70 feet ahead. That looked pretty good to you. We got 500 GPM at each zone. We've, we've given you the 1,570 feet that was on the plans. Does that look pretty good to you? It's not proportionally balanced. Why? We'd say, Chris, it's got one third, one third, one third. Yes, but why is zone three? Why is the zone three circuit setter critical circuit for the pump loop at 16 feet of drop? Why would you have that at 16 feet of drop? Remember, we actually calculated the head that was needed to be what? 54 feet. And now we come along and added 16 feet on the critical circuit plus 54 to get back to a 70. In other words, we're wasting the energy through that circuit set of why would we do that? Why would we waste that 16 feet of drop? Why? It's, that's the question. It's balanced, but it's not balanced per ASHRAE energy code. It's not balanced through proportional balance. When you do a true proportioning balance, the pressure drop through that circuit setter becomes zero or it's going to be wide open. Of course, it's realistically all circuit setters are going to have a little bit of a drop, but the bottom line is that last circuit setter in that critical circuit zone three needs to be wide open. That's the message. How do we do that? Let's do a read and set proportioning balance method. And of course, we have circuit setters or calibrated balancing devices all the way up to 12 inch to do these. They do a nice job of this, and that's what we're talking about. And basically, you see these benefits and features, which is not really why we're here, but you can do a calibrated balance, you can do a proportion, you can preset, you got your drain plugs and all of that. ASHRAE says you need balancing setters, circuit setters. ASHRAE, this is out of the handbook, 1999, even tells you where you need to have a balancing device. So these are the circuits that they would recommend to you that you put a balancing device. You can do less or you can do more, but if you need a guideline, or an engineer over needs a guideline of where you need to balance, go to this section out of the ASHRAE handbook and take the best available advice you can find. It just makes a lot of sense. So some guidelines about straight pipe on calibrated balancing devices upstream and downstream. And again, this is right out of ASHRAE, ASHRAE 1999. You see the applications page. In other words, you do want some straight pipe if you can get it to make sure you get that plus or minus 5% accuracy we talked about. Plus or minus 10 is probably okay, but I think most specifications probably going to read and probably should read plus or minus 5 as your guideline. So a little sidebar here that keeps coming up, especially from young people. Where should the uh, circuit setter be? Should it be on the supply side to a cooling coil or heating coil or on the outlet side? Why do all the drawings, why does everybody who kind of understands this put the balance amount, put the circuit setter on the return side where the two-way valve is? Why does everybody do that? Is there some reason for that? And the answer is yes, there is. You have to understand air control. You have to understand air moving around in a system. And when you put air knowledge, air system knowledge, together with balancing knowledge, you begin to understand quickly why the balancing valve needs to be on the return side. Very simple comment on air and water. Higher the pressure of air and water, the more air you can put in the water. The lower the pressure on water, the more air is going to pop out. So air is always in solution and water moving back and forth. So in the terminal unit, you're going to slow the velocity down a little bit. So it's a place air has been known to come out of solution simply because you're slowing the velocity down when you, when you hit a coil. That's okay, but a cooling coil or heating coil doesn't work too well with air in it. So we pr would prefer to keep the air out of there if we can. Now, if we put a circuit setter or balancing valve on the return and you turn the pump off and on, right now the pump's off at 20 pounds of pressure inside of that coil. Let's say we got a little air in it. We turn the pump on, I jump to 39 pounds. And I turn the pump on, jump to 39 pounds. That's great because I just increased the pressure from 20 to 39. And what is the entrained air going to do in that coil as I increase the pressure? We drive the air into the water by increasing the pressure. Now we can move the air over to the roll air tool, air separator, and get rid of the air. And the beauty of this is 
where the circuit setter is has an impact on how high that pressure becomes. I would prefer that pressure in my coil terminal unit to be as high as I can get it within reason. Higher the pressure, the more air I drive into it, the less troubles I'm going to have with air. So on the return side, got my 39 pounds of pressure, I got my 5 pounds of drop through my two-way valve. In this case, I got 8 pounds of drop through the circuit setter, so I got 22 pounds leaving, I'm at 39 pounds. Now, total pressure drop is 21 pounds. What's going to happen if I put the circuit setter on the supply side? What's going to happen to the pressure in my terminal unit that's now 39? Let's move it. I put it on the supply side, I now drop to 30 pounds. I'm doing the same flow, the same total pressures, but my effective pressure inside of my terminal when I move the circuit setter to the supply side drops from 39 pounds down to 30 and I drop to 30, it'll still work, but I'm not going to drive as much air into solution as I would at 39. So plain and simple, the proper place for a balancing device is on the return side, not the supply, because when you put them on the return side, the operating pressures inside of your coils run higher, and you'll get more air out of solution. Very important concept everybody needs to grasp, because it's been missed sometimes, and it can really solve a lot of problems for you. Now moving back to our balancing problem here we had, let's do this, uh, this, this read and set bit. We, we're, we're at 1800 GPM, 64 feet ahead when we just turned the pump on, remember? 36 brake horsepower, all we did was turn the pump on. No balancing, no circuit setters, no throttling, everything just wide open. Let's add circuit setters. Let's add a circuit setter to each circuit and let's do a proportioning balance. Let's see what we can make that happen. Remember, we want to wind up with 500 GPM in each zone. Remember, we want each zone to be 33% of the total pump flow. That's what we're after. So, open up the circuit setters and two-way valves wide open. Let's do a read and, and, and set method here and make sure we know, know where we're going. First of all, where is the critical circuit? Hope you realize the critical circuit zone three is not flowing enough flow. It's at 478 designs 500. What do we say the other goal proportion balance was? Leave that circuit setter wide open. We need to be able to read the flow there to make sure we got the 500 GPM, but we don't want to throttle there. We want the circuit setter in zone three to be wide open. We won't be able to read the 500, but we don't want to throttle there. It would be a waste of energy. So what we want to do is adjust the circuit setters on zone one and zone two to get one third one-third, one-third. And all we're going to do is we're going to go to the first circuit, circuit one, that circuit setter. We're going to read the flow through it, which is 670 GPM. We're going to adjust it down until it's one-third of the total pump flow. Now, as you adjust it down, pump one, the pump flow is going to go down a little bit too. So the true proportioning balance is I'm looking at the flow at the pump. I'm looking at the flow in zone one. I'm going to make zone one one-third of the total pump flow. And as I throttle zone one, pump flow is going to go down a little bit because I'm adding resistance. Got it? Then I went over to zone two. So I start zone one. I go to zone two next. I do the same thing. I got zone one at one third of the total pump flow. I now move over to zone two and I throttle the circuit setter on zone two until it reads one third of the total pump flow. Looking at the pump flow at the same time. Now obviously the pump flow is coming down a little bit more. If I make two passes doing that logic, I'll have it balanced. Two passes. And what I'm after is to get zone one to be one third of the total pump flow, zone two to be one third of the total pump flow. With two passes, I can do that. And if I got one third and one third, what's left with zone three? It's got to be one third. Come on, guys, it's that simple. But I've left circuit setter on zone three wide open. I want it to stay open. That's my test to see if I'm proportionally balanced. So now I've done zone two bit. I make two passes, making sure so each one of them has got 33% of the total flow. And where do I wind up? I just did my zone two, my second pass, and once I redo this twice, basically I've got 33% flow to each zone. It will not be 500 GPM yet because I haven't slowed the pump down, I haven't trimmed the pump and power. What am I after? I'm after it to be one third, one third, one third. So now when I've done the two passes, my pump is back to 1,760 GPM at 65 feet ahead. My proportioning balance is done. I've got each zone at one-third. 
one third, one third. I've got zone three circuit set or wide open. I haven't done anything to pump yet. The throttle valve of the pump still wide open. And I now have shifted the system curve over to 1760 GPM at 65 feet ahead. Now what do I do? So what's happened now? Repeating myself to make sure you understand this. I'm after 500 each, but the first step is the proportioning balance. Once I've done those two zones and I've got a proportioning balance, I'm through with the balance. Now I've got a pump and power, I got a pump and triller, pump and impeller trimming problem. I've got a problem to trim the pump and impeller. I'll put a verbal speed drive and slow it down. Wait a minute, what are you telling me? I'm saying I got 587 GPM zone one, zone two, and zone three. Each zone is one third of the total, and the total now is 1760 GPM. I only need 1500, but I'm giving you 1760 because I have not throttled the pump, and I'm producing my brake horsepower still up pretty high. So the message is, I have proportioning balances. We're there. What do we do next? Well, we throttle the triple duty valve. And when we throttle the triple duty valve, lo and behold, if I take 16 feet of drop through the triple duty valve, I keep the circuit setter on zone one wide open, I'm magically back to 500 GPM zone one, two, and three. My proportioning balance is done. Each zone has got the right flow, one third, one third. I've taken the extra 16 feet ahead and I've moved it to the discharge of the pump. So what have I got to do now? Trim the pump impeller, put a verbal speed drive on it, and take those 16 feet ahead out. Two things I want you to remember. Remember the critical circuit calculations first time around was what do we need? 54 feet ahead. 54 plus 16 is 70 feet ahead. Where was the 16 feet ahead before? We had it on zone three, which we said was kind of dumb to do it on zone three. We want zone three to critical circuit. We want the balance about to be wide open. We want to get rid of the 16 feet ahead. We don't want to have to pump, pump against it. So when you do a true proportioning balance, you're going to have the critical circuit in your building with the, with the circuit set or the calibrated balancing valve wide open. You're going to move the extra head over to the pump discharge. You're going to pull the pump impeller and trim it, or you're going to put a verbal speed drive on it, slow it down. You're going to save the operating cost. That's simple. So just make sure you get the total message here. When I go to the pump and I get rid of the 16 feet, I can trim the impeller or throw a speed drive. I back down to my 54 feet ahead, which is what I need for the critical circuit, and I just got down to 25 brake horsepower. Now you see why we looked at the pump impeller trim first before we came here so you know how to do it. So here's your test. If you're an engineer or any kind of balancing authority, if somebody balances your job and tells you it's been done per ASHRAE 90.1 2010 energy code, that they've done a proportioning balance, the first question you should have to that balancing person is, show me the critical circuit in my building. Where is the critical circuit in my whole complex? And that balancing valve best be wide open or it's not proportioning balance. Ask them to show you the critical circuit. In this case, is critical circuit is on three, and that balancing valve is wide open. They can't show you that that balancing valve is wide open. If they don't know where the critical circuit is, fire them. That's serious. Fire them. Because you have to know where the critical circuit is in order to do a proportioning balance. And that circuit, when you get through, should be wide open. It's very basic stuff. By the way, that would be your critical circuit for calculating the pump head too. So you're going to do a detailed pump head loss calculation. It's the same circuit as the critical balancing circuit. The two are the same. And we need to be teaching that to everybody so they grasp the concept. Good. You kind of got the message. We've done a good job here. We just met the energy code. If system is balanced correctly, one of the circuit setters has to be wide open. That's going to be the critical circuit. Kind of got the message, and you see the pellet trim is there, and I'm down to 25 brake horsepower. What if we add a zone four to this system in the future? And the answer is we messed the balance up. We got to go back and rebalance with a calibrated hard balance. If you add to the system in the future on that pump loop, the critical circuit's going to change. The numbers are going to change. You'd have to do a whole brand new balance. So let's look at the uh, possibility of preset. We won't spend a whole lot of time on this because uh, engineers that do preset, it'll work fine. What we're saying is 
we can take a calibrated balancing device like a circuit setter. We can take the papers, your, your drawings, we can calculate the settings on these circuit setters on a piece of paper and tell you how to set them to pre-balance and have it balance when you turn the system on. But we make it a big assumption. The assumption we're making is that it's going to go in exactly the way you drew it, that you're going to buy the exact products that are specified. If I do that, I can do the preset calculations. The little circuit setter will take care of that. It'll tell you what degree setting to set them on, what's the pressure drop required, and we can go through that and wind up at the same point as you did before when you did the proportioning balance on the job site by actually reading. In other words, we would do the calculations and we would preset the circuit setter on zone three at wide open. We would identify that to be the critical circuit. We would preset zone two circuit setter with a pressure drop of three feet at 500 GPM. We would preset zone one circuit setter at 16 feet of drop at a flow rate of 500 GPM, and we would trim the pump and propeller down from the 16 feet and get rid of it. Notice you can do this if you're on a piece of paper as long as your job goes in the way you designed. And the problem is it probably is not going to do that. So it's available. You can do it. That's your problem with it. So resulting proportioning balance and impeller trim presetting winds up being the exact same place as you went on the job site and read your way through it. So systems balanced correctly. How many times have we said this? It's critical out of this whole seminar you get this. If you're proportioning balance, the critical circuit balance and valve should be what? Wide open. If it's not, you have not met the energy code. How about automatic balance and balance? How about these circuit centuries, all the flows we deal with? How about this? How about the flow limiters? What's a good way to do that? Now, the whole concept of a flow limiter is we have a spring loader device that we can flow water through, and it will change the orifice size based on the differential pressure going through it. Now, as we change the orifice size going through these devices, you see the little input there. We can guarantee you plus or minus 5% accuracy on these things for whatever GPM you buy them for, whatever you got them set on. So within the range of minimum pressure required, and that's the thing you need to understand, there's a spring in these things, all of them, whatever brand you buy. There's some minimum differential pressure required across that spring to make it start working. If you don't have that minimum differential pressure to make the spring start moving back and forth, it's not doing anything. It can't. It's just an inert piece of pipe. So you can buy them different ranges. Let's just assume we got the one on the chart here that needs two pounds of deferential minimum, about what, 2.31 feet a pound, let's say five feet, two pounds of five feet. We need that much pressure drop across this flow limit to, to make it work. If it's less than that, it's not working. If it's more than two pounds, that's okay up to what? Up to 32 pounds of drop. So the one we just looked at the minimum pressure to make it work is 2 pounds or 5 feet. The max is 32 pounds. So anywhere between 2 pounds and 32 pounds, this device is going to give you a set GPM of what you buy it for, what you set it on if it's a manual adjustable. And it's going to hold that within plus or minus 5%. That's a flow limiter. Some people call it automatic balancing devices. I prefer to call them flow limiters because they only work within that pressure range, which is a good range. But you've got to understand you need that 2 pounds to make it work. So let's see what would happen if I use one of these automatic balancing devices. Here's one working between the two pounds and, and the 32 pounds. There's another one best at five, not trying to get a specific product. If you see that flat red line across the top, it's going to give you the same flow between two pounds and 32 pounds of pressure drop plus or minus 5%. That's what a flow limiter does. And if you keep it in that operating range, you do a pretty good job. Here's one that's got more pressure drop through it than design, and now the spring has totally collapsed, as you see in the picture. It's not doing anything because it can't move anymore. Very unusual to get one at that kind of situation because that's a lot of pressure drop, but just realize if you went beyond the allowable pressure drop, that's what would happen. It would also be singing to you. It'd be pretty noisy. So let's go back to our system for 1,500 GPM, 70 feet ahead. Let's put in automatic balancing devices. Let's put in the automatic flow limiters. Let's just install some. So that's what I've done on the bottom. And what would you buy the flow limiters for? The little blue boxes at the bottom of there. You would buy them, or you, if you had a or circuit century type of animal, you would set them for what? 500 GPM. So you set them for 500 GPM. Let's turn the pump on. 
I turned up up on, and lo and behold, I've got 500 GPM to each zone. Wow, that's fantastic. All I did was turn the pump on, didn't do anything else. Because they've been purchased for 500, they won't go beyond 500 as long as you're there. Now notice something, notice something. Notice zone three, which is still the critical circuit, is at uh, 16 feet of drop. Wow, okay. Uh, through the flow setter, with all everything wide open, Th through the flow limiter, flow setter. Zone two is at, what, 19 feet, and zone four is at 32 feet. My pump's at 1,500 GPM, 70 feet ahead, exactly what you specify. So what's wrong with this? Is this proportioning balance? I got my proportions, 500, 500, 500, one-third, one-third, one-third. One third. I got design flow, 1,570 feet. Can I improve this? Is anything wrong with this? And my question to you is, where is your critical circuit? Zone three again. And you got a device there at 16 feet. What is a minimum pressure drop across zone three's flow limiter to make it work, to make you give you 500 GPM? And the minimum is two pounds or five feet. Two pounds, five feet. In other words, I got 16 feet of pressure drop across the flow limiter on zone three, and I only need what? Only need five to make it work. So I can improve the system dramatically by slowing the pump down and or trim the pump impeller, saving a lot of energy, and I can reduce the 16 feet on zone three down to the minimum I need to make it work properly, which is five, and it, what happens then? Let's just make sure you understand. What can we do to improve the system? There we go. I have dropped the 16 down to five. I've dropped the 70 feet ahead on the big pump down to 59. Now, with the circuit setter, it was down to 54. Now, what's the difference? The difference is I need that five feet of drop on an automatic flow limiter to make that spring move back and forth. I don't have a spring in the circuit setter. So I need a little more pressure drop here. But once I get that minimum five feet, I don't need any more than that. So proportioning balance can still be done with flow limiters. But what you've got to do is read the pressure drop across the critical circuit again, and you've got to slow the pump down and or trim the pump impeller until you're down to that minimum pressure required to make the flow limiter work on zone three of the critical circuit, which is five feet. Perfect. Well done. Now you know how to proportion balance. And again, you need a balancing guy on a job with flow limiters to verify these flow limiters to make sure they're working. And again, on the balancing report, they should be able to tell you where is the flow limiter in the critical circuit and what is the pressure drop across that flow limiter in the critical circuit. If they can do that, it's been proportioning balanced. If they can't do that, they don't understand this, you need to fire them. That's pretty strong stuff, but if we're going to save the energy, let's be serious about it. We have to understand fundamentals of laws. We have to recognize a critical circuit. We want that to have the minimum pressure drop required, and that way we make everything more efficient. About verbal speed pumping in balance, are there any issues there we should kind of be aware of? What changes it? So let's go to put a verbal speed drive on our system. Now we've done our proportioning balance. We did a circuit set of balance. That means zone three there, as you see, is wide open. Now make sure you don't misunderstand the comment. Circuit set is going to have a little pressure drop through it. But I'm saying to you, zone three circuit setter needs to be wide open. Needs to be wide open is the critical thing here. Make sure you gotta gotta kind of kind of understand that. So we put all this together is um, I got a proportion balance. Everything's fine. Let's make it verbal speed. How are you going to control your 1,500 GPM with verbal speed? Where do you put the deferential pressure transducer? Normally, I'd put it across the critical circuit. We've already decided that the critical circuit was zone three. Normally, I put it across the circuit setter, the two-way valve, and the coil. In this case, I would have my set point for 20 feet. 500 GPM through the coil is 10, 10 for my two-way valve. My circuit set, I'm going to assume, is zero for the time being. 20 feet. That means I'm going to run my verbal speed pump 1500 GPM even at low flows. The verbal flow means verbal loads. I'm not going to stay at 1500. We'll be moving back and forth as, as I open and close the two with apps. So I'm going to make sure I got 20 feet available across zone three always. If 20 feet is always available across zone three, then when somebody comes into the room, takes a T-stat on the wall, and opens a two-way valve on zone three wide open, they got full cooling available right now. Then I'll have to wait. I need 20 feet, a control head, 20 feet, a minimum head that my pump's got to put out 
always to make sure zone three is ready to go whenever somebody comes in and opens that back. So that's the concept. What happens with this when we kind of move around? What happens if the flow in zone three is zero? I did a proportioning balance. Go look at zone two. I need 15 for the coil, 10 is what, 25, and I need three feet, that would be, what? help me out a little bit, that'd be 25, 28 feet across zone two to make it be able to flow 500 GPM. So you always want to be able to flow instantly whatever the need of the, of the system may be. It may not be 500, but if you need 500, you've got to be able to flow it. That kind of becomes your control point, that's your minimum control here you've got to have available. So the question becomes, what happens to the deferential pressure across zone two that needs 28 feet to flow 500 GPM if zone three has no flow set for 20 feet? What happens to the deferential pressure across zone two as you verbal speed drive as you start slowing the pump down? Let's go to zone three. Zone three is set for 20 feet. But if there's no flow, then the four feet on the supply side of zone three and the four feet on the return side of zone three go to what? They go to zero. There's no head. There's no flow. So your 20 feet deferential, there's no flow through zone three, backs down to zone two. And now I only have 20 feet of deferential across zone two. And you need how much? 25, 28 feet. You're in trouble. You got your pump set to give you 20 feet of drop across the cross there always, and you need 28 for full flow. You cannot satisfy the load. Now you might get away with it, but you might have a problem. So the issue is kind of deep. Comment is you might need a little different different manual balancing for variable speed systems on direct return. You might need to look at where your deferential pressure control points are, or you might need to do a different kind of a balance. One solution to this would be you put a deferential pressure transducer on every zone. We see people doing that. We, you know, this is the case. You use three deferential pressure transducers to the pump, and then one throws and set point takes over and controls. Everybody's happy. costs more money. That's okay. And we see that done a lot. It's a good reason here to use multiple sensors. Let's take a look at another way to do that would be with balance. So let's do a little modified balance and see what happens. I turn the system on again. I think you see that zone one's in zone two. And if zone three has no flow and you got zero pressure drop across the supply return piping to zone three, I wind up with 20 feet across zone two and we're not going to have design flow. What are some things we could do maybe to fix that? We could do an alternate balancing concept on variable speed, variable flow balancing with circuit setters. We could come along and say, let's ignore the four feet on the supply side and the four feet on the return side. Let's just balance each circuit against each other. In other words, let's take zone one and make the total pressure drop across zone one 25 feet. Let's go to zone two. Let's make the total pressure drop just across that zone 25 feet. Let's go to zone three. Let's just make the total pressure drop across zone three, 25 feet. And what we did, we just ignored the four foot pressure drop segments. If you do that and you set your deferential pressure transducer control up from 20 to 25 feet, all of a sudden now you've got a modified balance that would assure you, no matter what the flow, every zone has 25 feet across it and 25 feet across zone two or 25 feet across zone one will give you the full required flow of 500 GPM. Another way of getting there, and your smart balancing people understand this, it's a tricky way to do things, but it works. Not a bad idea. Let's take a little bit more happens to what happens at zone three at zero flow. And as you can see, zone three at zero flow with a five feet, I'm okay. All the flows get there. So you kind of got the idea how the 25 foot would work and you see how an alternate balance the example takes care of the verbal speed issue. Let's just see what happens when we go a little bit further with this and we start morning startups and back up. What happens to zone three? Kind of mentioned to you before, if you've got this night setback thing and you're going at it, that when you get out of control, the two-way valve, this case zone one, it's going to grab all the flow it can. So if I did the alternate balance thing, 
that's fine. But what's going to happen to you is zone one is going to grab more than 500 GPM because it's going to be more deferential pressure available to it than 25 feet. You're going to have max deferential 35 or 40 feet across it. And on startup, that two-way valve on zone one is going to be grabbing everything it can and it's going to overflow. Zone three is going to get less flow. So one problem with this alternate balancing procedure is if you're doing night setbacks, it's going to make it worse. It's going to make zone one grab more flow coming up online, and zone three is going to suffer until the two-way valves start modulating, until the two-way valves take control. When the two-way valve is wide open, it's going to try to grab all the water it can get its hands on. So maybe one possibility would be go back to our flow limbers, go back to our automatic balancing valves, or whatever you like to call them. Let's go back and look at that. What would happen if I put them on variable speed? Here's a situation that I went back to my original. This has been proportioning bounce. As you can see, I've got five feet of drop through zone three's flow limber, my automatic balancing devices. I've got five feet. Minimum required to make this spring works two pounds of five feet. So now my pressure drops, what, 10, 10, and 5. And I'm going to set my deferential pressure transducer, let's say, on 30 feet. You might even set it a little bit tighter, but let's set it on 30 because why? Now I've got the ability to flow. What does that mean? A little tricky again, but go to zone two. I've got eight feet of pressure drop there under full flow. What is the minimum pressure drop across my flow limiter on zone two that I need to make it work? Five. So what's the worst situation for my deferential pressure transducer? Fifteen. I'm zone two. Fifteen plus ten plus five is thirty feet. So if zone three has no flow, if I up the deferential set point from 25 to 30 feet on zone 3, I've got 30 feet available for zone 2 at a low flow condition. Everybody's happy. In other words, as a procedure with flow limiters, automatic balancing devices that I can set up, that I can have it self-balancing out of the box, and I can trim the impeller down to my 5 feet on my critical circuit, and I can make it have the right flow to each zone. What's nice about a flow limiter, remember, is if the max flow to that zone is 500 GPM, it will not let it go past 500 GPM. So a night setback or warm-ups back and forth, they will restrict the zone to the full flow allowed across it. It will not go to six or 700 GPM. It's going to stop at five. With a two-way valve and a manual balance, it can go beyond five. So this makes a little bit of sense in this particular situation with night setback. What happens if zone three has zero load? then I'm okay, I can flow the 500 GPM required. And design flow goes to zones one and zone two as we just described. We can get our design flow. Let's look again at pressure independent control valves a little bit and bring them into the discussion. Now, we can talk products, but basically a pressure independent control valve is one that limits the flow like a flow limited to whatever you got it set on, plus it keeps a constant deferential pressure across the two-way valve. Kind of like having two valves in one. It keeps a constant deferential pressure across the two-way valve. So now if you know the position of the valve, you know the flow. The two-way valve sees a constant deferential pressure. That's critical. Here's, a, here's an animal or a, a product that we sell that you can actually read the flow in GPM and set it. That's a pretty neat idea. You can actually dial in the flow you want in GPM, run a little red dial there. You can dial the GPM in, it's plus or minus 5% accuracy, and you've got full stroke available to you, great concept. So the point of a, a pressure independent control valve is to be able to make sure you limit the flow and you keep the delta T up at partial loads. That's the advantage of a pressure independent control valve. So let's get away from the product a little bit and get over to what we're trying to do. Here's a typical ARI certified cooling coil. And real quick, this is, coil was picked for 12 degree delta T at 100% load, which is the vertical axis on the left, at 100% flow, which is the horizontal axis on the bottom. So if I go to 100% chill water flow, go straight up to the solid black line, you'll see to the left 100% load, and the solid black line is 12 degree delta T. Great. That's what you expect, that's what you design, that's what your chill plant was picked on, that's a delta T required, that's how you keep your return chill water temperatures up, that's how all these good things are going to happen to you if I can hold it 12 degrees. 
Now, ARR goes a step further. We don't normally run cooling coils 100% load. I would say 50% load would be where we normally are. So with 50% load, let's assume we'd have 50% shear water flow. Let's just take a look at half flow. Let's look at half flow in GPM through a typical ARI certified cooling coil. See what we would predict would happen to the ability to cool. Let's see what we would predict would happen to the, the delta T. So in this case, if you went to 50% design flow and you go straight up, where are you coming out? Let's just see. We go straight up at 50%. Looks to me like we're running in the neighborhood of 75 to 80% cooling. Take the 50% straight vertical line up to the black line. The black line is the coil line. To the left, I'm seeing about 80% cooling. Wow. At half flow, in theory, I'm going to get 80% cooling. What delta T? The delta T is colored. The 12 degree delta T is that kind of a bluish line, I guess, green line. The purple or pink line, pink line at the top is the delta T would be at 50%. So 50% flow, the pink line crosses the black line right about 50%. That pink line is 19 degree delta T. ARI, ARI is telling you as you reduce flow and cooling core, your delta T should go up. Why in the real world does not, why is that not happening? Why? Why are we not getting a higher delta T across two-way valves and cooling coils apart flow? Here's the reason. You're getting unavoidable pressure variations in a system. Deferential pressures across a two-way valves are jumping up and down in great big systems. Not by huge numbers, but five or ten pounds. And they're changing instantaneously. You open and close valves, you turn pumps on and off, somebody's changing T stats. There always has these deferential pressure fluctuations. What does that do to you? Here's some charts. Gave you one on building one, here's another building, and you see that varying 10 to 15 pounds easily, very quickly, across the valves. What does that mean to you? If you have a two-way valve and you vary the deferential pressure across it, the load is not changing instantly, but the flow is. And we'll show you a chart of that in just a few minutes. How would a pressure independent control valve help you out there? Very simple. A pressure independent control valve is two pieces. This is a typical pressure independent control valve that you're looking at. The left hand side is your two-way valve. P1, P2 is going to stay constant. How in the world can P1, P2 stay constant? Because P1 to P3, the pressure in the control valve is spring-loaded. It's going to make sure that deferential pressure stays the same. The second part of this, the spring part of this part, is going to make sure the deferential pressure from P1 to P2 across your two-way valve stays constant always. Pretty neat trick, but that's what they do for a living. And what does that mean to you? Here's a central chill water plant, say a cooling coil, and you got direct return piping. And you've got to pick the two-way valves. Let's say it's a long campus run. So we got cooling coils, two-way valves, in close to the big pump from a this is my chill water distribution pump, pretty high head pump. What is it? Uh, you know, you see the deferential pressure, pretty high deferential pressure in close to the chill plant. Now as you move out further and further away to the end, the deferential pressure obviously goes down as I move, you know, 500 feet, 1,000 feet out in the pipe. To the last coil out there, there's very little deferential pressure left, and all you got is a two-way valve and the coil. So what happens in most cases is these two-way valves are always pretty much pick the same valve authority. Should not be, but they pretty much are. The same valve authority in close is out to the end, and if you do that, the same valve authority the one way out to the end, and the same valve authority for the valves in close to the chill plant, the valves in close to the chill plant become just on off valves. They don't even modulate. Pop up a little bit, probably going to eat them up. In other words, you're losing control of those valves. You have very little valve stroke. You're going to lose delta T control on them. They're going to have a tendency to take more, to, more water flow than design. You should be picking these valves on what? Every two-way valve here should be picked on CV. Every two-way valve here should be picked on authority and pressure drop available. You should run a detailed head loss calculation on every circuit on that campus for 1,000 valves and make the right valve authority and the right sieve every two way valve on that campus. That's not quite practical, you said. I'd agree with you, it's not. But you can do it. In theory, you can do that. But every time you change out a valve on a campus, you got to look at all the other 1,000 valves that are still there and make sure they got the right pressure drop. Putting all this together is two way valves properly picked should be picked on valve authority, rangeability, and CV every time. And the ones closest to the chill water plant have to have a much higher valve authority, much 
bigger pressure drop across them to make them open and close properly. Hard to do, nobody impossible, theoretically possible, but kind of hard to do in the real world. So that's why we want to look at pressure and vent control valves. Let's see if we can get this message across to you. Here's a two-way valve. Let's say this system is a 500 GPM coil. I've got a good two-way valve in here. Inlet pressure is 26 feet. Outlet pressure is 16 feet. I've got a valve set for 280 GPM, conventional, everyday two-way valve. What happens to the flow rate through this coil and through this two-way valve if I increase the differential pressure? I'm not going to change the position of the valve. I'm going to hold the valve position right where it is. I'm just going to increase that 26 feet to 36 feet. Still got 16 coming out. I got 10 feet of head across at 280 GPM. I want to double the available head from 36 to 16 to 20 feet. I'm not going to change the position of the two-way valve. I'm not going to change the load on the coil. This is instantaneous as this pressure drop changes across the valve that goes on in big systems every day. What happens to the flow rate? The flow rate jumps from 280 to 400 GPM. Jumps up. Did the cooling coil load change? Uh-uh. Not quickly. This is instantaneous. So instead of having a high delta T, you've got the same BTUs at 280 that you got at 400 GPM. If it's the same load and you increase your flow rate from 280 to 400, what's your delta T got to do? It's got to come down. Q is equal to GPM times 500 times delta T. Then when you have that coming down like that, your delta T has got to come down. You've lost control. If you've got a chill water plant, you've got to return chill water temperature problem. You can't load the chillers up. It's an energy hog. In other words, you're losing delta T because you have a standard two-way valve. You don't have the ability to react that quick. What happens if I put a pressure independent control valve in to the same situation? Now I change the valve to a pressure independent control valve. I got 10 feet of drop, 26 in, 16 out, 10 feet, 280 GPM. Great. What happens to a pressure independent control valve if I double the pressure drop across it? I go from 36 feet to 16 feet. What happens to my flood? I'm not changing the position of the valve now. I'm not going to change the position of the valve. Pressure independent control valve with the spring load will pick up on that deferential pressure increase instantaneously and hold it to 280. So now I have the ability with a constant change in deferential pressure to hold my delta T. I can get the higher delta. I can get my return chill water temperatures up. I can get my return hot water temperatures down. Yeah, you want to do two separate things there, but it's the same thing. You want the highest delta T's you can get. In order to get them, pressure independent control valves will do it for you. And one of my pet peeves is I got people out believing you can put a two-way valve in series with a flow limiter and do the same thing. By the way, before I leave this slide, you would, in theory, no longer need a balancing valve because now you can look at the position of the two-way valve and the particular pick valves we have have GPM on the dial. You can actually read the GPM on the dial of a Bell and Gossett pick valve. But where we are right now, we no longer need a balancing valve if you could do that. Let's take a look at this again. As long as I stay, just like a flow limiter, within that straight line, minimum pressure required to make it work of 5 pounds, in this case the max is 70, as long as I stay in that range across my two-way pick control valve, I'm going to maintain flow rate. I'm going to give you the highest possible delta T. I'm going to give the highest possible efficient system with a pressure independent control valve. Like I said, one of my pet peeves, I have people telling me, you just put a two-way valve in series with, it, with, with a flow limiter. You can do the same thing. Let's just make sure you understand that's an outright lie. It's just not true. It's not true. Why is it not true? I've got my situation. This is a 500 GPM coil. 500 GPM coil. So if you've got a 500 GPM coil, at what flow rate do you have to pick your flow limiter? A 500. So I put a 500 GPM flow limit in series with my two-way valve. i got the same setup as before, standard two-way valve. i got a flow limit pick for 500, but I'm running at 280 GPM. I, my valve, my two-way valve is partially closed. i got a partial load. i got 10 feet of drop. I'm running at 280 GPM. Everybody's happy. What happens if this deferential pressure thing changes again? to 20 feet like we did in the previous example. The two-way valve is going to jump up to 400 GPM again. I'm going to lose delta T control because why? Because that pick valve is not here. You've got a regular two-way calibrated valve. 
What is the flow limit doing at 400 GPM that you pick for 500? Nothing. There's not enough deferential pressure across the spring to make it work. It's sitting there deaf, dumb, and happy, just sitting there. That flow limit is not going to do anything until you get to 500 GPM. That automatic balancing valve is not even going to start functioning until you get to 500 GPM. So now I've jumped from 280 to 400. Load didn't change. Deferential pressure changed. I lost delta T control. So, two-way valve in series where an automatic balance and a flow limit is not the same thing as a pick valve. That's a lie. Do not accept that. Do not accept that it's the same thing. It is not. Pressure independent control valves would keep your delta T up. This would help with the total flow. It will never be over 500 GPM. That's all it's going to do for you. So enough set on the pick valve. You kind of got the concept how it works. The idea is that spring loader is going to maintain a constant deferential across the two-way valve, P1, P2. You can now pick your pressure independent control valves on GPM. You don't even have to worry about CV. You can now pick, that's right, you can pick your control valves now just on gallons per minute. What GPM is it? What valve do I need? You don't worry about valve authority. The pressure independent control valve will take care of that for you. So I start tying all this stuff together a little bit. What can pressure independent control valves do for my system? And I kind of jumped ahead a little bit on myself, but basically between 5 pounds and 70 pounds, I'm going to keep a constant flow no matter what the deferential pressure does. My control valves will stay in the same position. I'm going to get your delta T's up. This is a product we have. Don't want to go through it too much right here, but the basic idea is we give you full stroke, full stroke, no matter what the setting. You can set the total flow limit on these animals, and they read in GPM. Great benefits. We kind of went through the whole issue. I don't want to bore you too much. You can read them right here, but we can maintain constant flow as I change deferential pressure transducer as I change the deferential pressure. I can prevent, prevent valve hunting. I can reduce power and energy costs because I'm giving your high delta T. I increase the efficiencies of the boilers and the chillers as I increase your delta T. I don't worry about valve authority, really. The pressure independent control valve takes it. I can just pick them on GPM. You can set the max flow through them. It takes an effect, all those deferential pressure things going on in my system and just neutralizes them. So I don't have to worry about them. Bottom line. You can pick them on GPM. You don't have to worry about the CDs of the valve so much. So future predictions and summary, I think I kind of got you there. But basically, we've got to continue the balance. Pressure and control valves have a bright future because they need to be here to help us get that delta T up. You cannot maximize efficiency or a chiller or a boiler unless you balance. I do believe pressure and control valves have a bright future here because they can help us maximize those delta T's. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your time. We've had a lot of fun. Hope you've learned a few bits and pieces. See you on our next WebEx. Thank you.